Welcome to this episode of Ars Electronica Future Lab 25th anniversary. The topic of this episode is creative intelligence. So it is obviously about creative applications of AI. My name is Ali Nikrang. I am a key researcher and artist at Ars Electronica Future Lab. And I will show you several examples of how AI can be applied to creative tasks. But first, I would like to begin with the concept of creativity and what we understand under creativity. Afterwards, uh, I will show you several examples in the field of text generation, image generation, and also music generation. So let's begin with creativity. There are different definitions of creativity. One very commonly used definition uh, defines creativity as a new combination of elements that is of value. So it means we have two qualities, value and novelty. In an AI context, both of them are actually very challenging to estimate. A naive approach to estimate the novelty, for example, would be to, take, to check the data set and see if, a, if an AI result occurs there or not. But of course, it doesn't mean that the result doesn't exist elsewhere. This is especially interesting when we remember that these systems, AI systems, are trained to produce similar but not identical data as in the data set. So the question here is, at what level is something creative or new? And value is much more difficult to estimate, especially in an art context. Because we all know about um, artworks that have been highly underestimated at the time of creation. But uh, in the context of AI, still we can use theoretical points of view. For example, if you generate images uh, or faces, human faces with AI, and you see that the face has two different colors for the eyes, you can say, OK, this is something that uh, can be improved. But as AI systems are getting better and better, this approach comes very fast to its limitation. So in summary, my point is that creativity remains a highly subjective topic, which is, as a matter of fact, a big challenge for research. Because in research, we always want to compare different models, different approaches in an objective way and not dependent on human uh, opinion. So let's begin with the first uh, application of AI. It is uh, created by an international team, including John Bam Bramley and uh, Hide Ogawa, and it is called What the Ghost Dreams Of. It uses StyleGAN technology in background to generate new faces. When you enter Ars Electronica Understanding AI exhibition, uh, you will see a big eye symbolizing the input of AI. It takes a picture from your face and transforms your face into new faces that are generated on the fly and don't exist in the real world. I think it's a very good example of AI-based creativity as it visualizes very well the concept of transformation. When you train an AI system, the result of the training is nothing else than a so-called inner representation of the data. It consists of all the features that AI has learned during the training. We can imagine it as a space, as a multi-dimensional vector space, or we can imagine it in three dimensions, just for simplicity. And every data point can be represented somewhere in this space as a position. So for example, your face as a data point can be somewhere in this space, and the AI can simply take another position randomly and transform your face uh, to that position. So it goes step by step from your face to, to the other position and generates uh, new faces. So we can say actually that data representation and transformation is the core of AI creativity. But the interesting thing about this, uh, about this is that this space doesn't change after training. So actually it means we expect creativity from a frozen space, which is a bit contradictory. Therefore, for me, is AI creativity more about exploration than creation. We explore the perspective of AI on the data by creating new similar data. The next demo is called GPT-2. 
It's a language model that is developed and trained at OpenAI. Uh, it is trained with 40 gigabyte textual data, which is a lot. And the task of the training was actually to, to just to learn to predict the next word given previous words or previous context. So imagine everything I said today is the previous context, and the task of GPT-2 would be to predict my next word. So it may seem to be very unintuitive for humans, but research has shown that these kind of tasks uh, work very well for natural language uh, processing models to learn the structure of the language. There are, of course, cases where it is not uh, possible to do that. There are cases where it is very clear because of the grammar, but cases where the, the continuation of the, uh, of the, lang of the sentence uh, is open. For example, if I say, today I'm going to talk about, so there is no way for, for a machine or even for a human to know what the topic of uh, my talk will be or what I'm going to talk about. As a human, of course, you have, you have sometimes the context. If you are participating in a talk, you, you would know what the topic of the talk is. But for a machine, there is no way to, to know that, actually, if it's not in the document. Therefore, it is important to mention that language is actually much more than only a sequence of words. So it reflects our world with all its objects, relations, and complexities. And it is where models like GPT-2 or other uh, natural language processing models come to their limitations because they only can learn the statistical patterns of the data and stati statistical patterns are not always consistent with the meaning of the language. What we have in background uh, is an interactive application using the large model of GPT-2 that is developed at FutureLab uh, by Florian Berger and me and uh, it's, it's, uh, it is running in real time and I would like to challenge the model a little and to add a sentence and to see what the model can generate of it. Um, I am going to use the same example I mentioned before. So today, I am going to talk about, and let's see what the model can generate out of it. So the result is, today I'm going to talk about the importance of the right to know. The right to know is a right we take for granted, but it is not a right we have always had. In the late 19th and early 20th century, most people had no idea what the right to know was. It was a concept that existed in the minds of some people, but it was not widely known uh, in the general public. In fact, the concept of the right to know did uh, not come into and so on. So you see, uh, the output is correct, uh, but um, if I enter the, the same sentence again, I will get something completely different because uh, it is just a combination of statistical patterns that are learned by uh, GPT-2. So let's do it again and uh, enter the same sentence. So the result is, today I am going to talk about, this is our uh, prefix, today I am going to talk about how I went from being a lazy person to becoming a workaholic. I am still working on that one, but I think I got it. I am sure you are wondering how I managed to get to where I am now, but I will give you the short version. My parents divorced when I was a teenager and I lived with my mom and stepdad for a few years. I had a lot of time on my hands. So you see, it's a completely different story than the first one. The first one was about uh, was it the right to know, and now it's about a person who obviously is successful and a workaholic, and it, he, was, or he or she uh, was a lazy person before that. So I think that the question that occurs here is, what's the meaning of these uh, sentences, of this output? And um, because GPT-2 has no intention to, or, or any AI system, they have no intention to share a meaning with us, to share a story with us, to, or to talk something about the right to, to know, as it was before. And all these things are important in the context of AI, because we get um, data, results that are correct, but 
the question is about what meaning they have. MuseNet was also developed at OpenAI by Christine Payne. It uses a very similar technology like GPT-2 and is able to generate music in such quality where it is not possible to say if the result was composed by a machine or by human. We used MuseNet in a project called Mahler Unfinished during Ars Electronica Festival 2019. The idea was to find out what an AI system can do with the theme of Gustav Mahler's last unfinished symphony. Because the theme of the symphony can be seen as a challenge for every AI-based composition system. It begins in only one voice without accompaniment and not even the tonality of the theme is clear at the beginning. So it is very unusual. It was remarkable what MuseNet composed based on the theme. It was able to take the dark, gloomy atmosphere of the theme and develop out of it a completely new, unexpected, but still natural sounding piece of music. The piece was performed by Bruckner Orchestra Linz, which is an awarded orchestra located here in Linz, along with the original symphony uh, by Gustav Mahler. And uh, we can say, according to the press and according to the audience, for non-experts, it wasn't possible to tell which piece was composed by AI and which piece was composed by Mahler. Let me show you a short video. The next demo is called Richard Carr, and it is an interactive AI-based composition system that we have been developing at Ars Electronica Future Lab. We use it in different projects and presented it in different public demonstrations. In its Italian origin, the word Richard Carr means search, but it also refers to a musical form of the Baroque and Renaissance periods. Composers use this form when searching for the musical potential of a given theme theme or melody. Richard Kai is trained with several thousand pieces of music and it is able to generate music that um, sounds human and natural. However, the real purpose of Richard Kai is not only investigating AI-based um, music composition systems, but also, most importantly, it implements uh, different experimental ways of how human and AI can collaborate to create music. Collaboration with modern AI is probably the biggest challenge in the field of AI creativity. Because, you know, AI systems or the new deep learning systems, they have millions of parameters. And it is not possible to say what the contribution of a single parameter uh, is to the final result. Actually, it doesn't work that way. It is more like about activation patterns involving groups of neurons occurring in the system. There is no way to communicate with such system in a human understandable way, especially in the field of music. But collaboration with human is actually crucial to create art. We can ask AI systems like Richard Carr to generate music as an exploration of the musical space that has been learned by the system. But if we want to create art or something that has a personal or human meaning, we have to go beyond the exploration. Because AI-based composition is often based on the concept of imitation. It is very similar to the concept of imitation game mentioned by Alan Turing, where the goal of the system is to mimic human behavior. But for artistic creation, we have to go beyond imitation because we have to find ways that push the model out of its imitative space and discover new ways of creation. And it can only be done in collaboration with humans who have the imagination and most importantly, the intention to reach a desired result. 
In the scope of Future Lab 25th anniversary, we use Richard Carr to create a piece of music that will be performed together with human musicians at Ars Electronica Festival 2021. The idea is to use the initial letters of Ars Electronica Future Lab and Ars Electronica Center. Both of them are celebrating their anniversary. So it sounds like this. A, it is A, Ars, E, Electronica Future Lab, and Ars, Electronica Center. It would be like... And um, we use Richard already to create several pieces to, uh, to find out what possibilities we have. But let me show you one of the pieces. But unfortunately, I only can play a few bars of it. Because as the AI has no idea about human limitations, the output is not playable with only two hands. Uh, the notes are too far from each other for a human to play. But luckily, we have a self-playing piano that is able to play it. The interesting point actually about this piece is for me personally, that it, is, that it shows that in collaboration with human, you can create something that is not similar to the data in the data set. In the data set, we only had classical music until 19th century, end of 19th century. And the music here actually sounds very minimalistic, almost like electronic music because of the highly precise repetitions it has. The music may sound familiar to you as it is the music we are using at the beginning and at the end of each uh, Future Lab uh, anniversary episode. But uh, for, for those episodes, we also ask human artists to arrange the music composed by the AI and make their own interpretation of it, just to have some musical diversity across all episodes. So in summary, we can say AI creativity is based on the concept of imitation and exploration. And therefore, human involvement is very, very crucial to create something that is really new, especially in the context of art. So thank you very much for watching this video. Hey, Hide. This is Hide Ogawa. He is one of the creators of the demo applications I showed you at the beginning of this episode what the ghost dreams of. Hida, what's the topic you are going to talk about? Thank you, Ari. I want to see you physically. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Hide Akiogawa, a director of our sector in the future lab. The next episode is about robots and robotinity. What is a robot? What is a human being? What is a humanity? And what is robotinity? Robotinity is an artistic research to explore robots, not as a tool technology, but as a culture technology. Together with a wonderful guest, Martina Moore, who is a professor of robot psychology at Johannes Kepler University, Linz. And actually she is a former member of our laboratory. We will discuss the future of robotinities. I'm very, very, looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. See you then. <laughs>